morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, Northwest Ferry, our service here. It's December 27th. Christmas is all finished. Um, I hope it was a, a good Christmas for you. I'm sure it was a different one, but I hope there were lots of uh, surprises and, and good moments of joy as well. As you can see, we're back to uh, uh, doing our services the old way. Um, the church is empty um, again, so we're doing our service all uh, online this week. Um, and before we begin, just a couple of announcements. Uh, first of all, we are going to, uh, uh, next Sunday the 3rd, we're actually not going to have a service. Uh, we're going to give our team uh, the Sunday off. So we, we will be back again on January the 10th. Um, we're not quite sure yet, uh, given our situation, whether we're going to continue uh, with um, having um, a live stream uh, in-person services or we're just going to go back to this format. So. As soon as I know, uh, I'll be sure to uh, let you know via Northwest News. Um, but every Sunday, regardless of whether there's people here or not, we're going to be having a service on YouTube. So we always invite you to join us, except for next Sunday when we're going to take a break. Um, just one announcement, and uh, we're going to watch it now. Good morning all. This is December 27th and it is such an exciting day. First, it means that we are almost done with 2020. But more importantly, it is the last Sunday of the month, which is when our outreach committee trots me out here to deliver my nonsense. My name is Alf Dick and I greet you as the official well-wisher. Now those of you who have heard me before will remember that we at Northwest Barry United are pretending. We pretend that our wishing well, located out there in the lobby, uh, in which we, we leave donations for charity, that it can talk, but only to me and to Catherine Delinardo, our church administrator. And I am here now, as directed by the wishing well, to do my duty. Uh, actually, three duties, after the wishing well gave me an extra job last month, you'll recall. First, I wish you well for today and the balance of the week, the month, and the year. Secondly, I am instructed by the wishing well to take another step to expand the vocabulary of our church with the wishing well word of the month, and it is euphoria. Yes, euphoria, E-U-P-H-O-R-I-A. It is a noun, and it means a feeling of well-being or elation. It's like the feeling that many of us have at the end of Phil's sermon, not, not because he's finished, but because of the lovely message that he's delivered. Euphoria. Now, when I was a boy, the newspaper had a little feature in it called Word of the Day, and it gave them out the word and how to pronounce it, how to use it, and it said, use this word three times in a sentence, and it is yours for life. So there you are, euphoria. Use it in a sentence three times, and it's yours, no charge. And the Wishing Well thanks you again for giving it that full feeling with December's donations to the Women's and Children's Shelter. Well done, folks. And now it's time to announce the charity that the Wishing Well wishes to benefit in January 2021. So again, audience participation. The Wishing Well knows that you are not allowed to sing, but it knows that you do wonderful drum rolls. So let's do it together with gusto. And three, two, one, drum roll. Oop, stop. It is Youth Haven. Youth Haven is Simcoe County's only youth shelter. 80% of its kids are fleeing domestic violence, neglect, physical or sexual abuse. And it's more than just a place to stay. They offer supportive services like counseling, life skills, and planning to develop real life skills. Youth Haven needs a really wide variety of things. Here are just a few. Shampoo, conditioner, slippers, hairbrushes, pajamas, puzzles, charging cords, gift cards such as Tim Horton, Dollar Store, Shoppers, McDonald's. A more complete list will appear in Northwest News. So please see what you can do for these young people and to give the wishing well that full feeling. Maybe after making a donation, you may experience euphoria. And now 
until we meet again in one month's time, Happy New Year, and I wish you well. Wow, what an inspiration. Um, you have all been so generous and so incredible in your financial support to Northwest Barry this year. Our staff can now move into 2021 knowing that they are supported and that we can still have a spiritual community no matter what the year throws at us. Um, we're pleased to announce that so far, Daniel, we have exceeded our goal. What a wonderful way to end the year and move into Christmas. Uh, if you still have a gift that you are planning to make and it's the last thing you need to cross off your list so that you can relax, your donation is always welcome and Catherine will process it in the new year. Until then, thank you all for being so generous and um, we look forward to seeing you next year. Right, Daniel? Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Merry Christmas. I invite you now to listen to the words of the call to worship. Gifts are open, the meal is done, but the season of Christmas is still with us. The journey towards love, peace, joy, and hope is never ending. Like the wise men of old, may we keep the star of wonder before us and may it lead us on a journey of faith into the new year. And please join me at home now in the singing of our opening hymn. pray. God of new beginnings, the day of 
Joy is behind us. But ahead is a new year of hope and promise. And quite frankly, God, do we ever need it. May you fit us for the journey that is ahead as we walk into the new year with a commitment to seek justice, live gently, and always to embrace compassion. May the year ahead bring renewed hope to weary hearts, renewed connections to those living by themselves, and renewed promise that better days are indeed ahead. May we begin that journey today as we open our hearts to the joy of your spirit and your invitation to bold and faithful living. Amen. message today, I'd like to talk about the story of the wise men. So first, let me read it again from the pages of the Bible. It's taken from Matthew chapter 2. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and we have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned for them the exact time when the star appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may go also and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Amen. We three kings of Orient are, bearing gifts we travel afar, field and fountain, moor and mountain, following yonder star. How well we know that song. And how well we always love to depict those 
three kings in our pageant and in our nativity scenes, following the star to take them to the manger. When I was growing up, I was in the church pageant every year in my home church. And you quickly discovered that church pageants can be a little on the elitist side. At least mine was. It was more structured than British aristocracy. In other words, there was a pecking order as to who got to play what, especially for the boys. For the girls, it was pretty simple. When you start out, you're a junior angel. Then after you put your time in for a couple years, you become a senior angel. And if you prove to have some exceptional kind of talent, which sadly basically meant long blonde hair, it was the 70s after all, then you got to be Gabriel. We never really counted Mary because she always was played by a relative of the minister. Nepotism was alive and well in the suburbs of Toronto. But for the boys, it was a little more difficult because we had the kings to deal with. There was an entirely different level of status to insert into the mix. So we went junior shepherd, senior shepherd, and then the equivalent of Gabriel for the boys was the shepherd who got to hold the stuffed lamb. That was the the height of shepherdhood. But then we had the kings. The girls didn't have to worry about this extra part of the story, but, but we did. So who would play the kings? It wasn't based on talent or, or poise or stateliness. It was based entirely on height. If you were short, you were shepherd. If you were a little less short, you were a senior shepherd. And if you were tall, you were a king. And that's just the way it was. If you didn't like it, you could argue with your genes. What that meant for me was that my tenure as a shepherd was pretty short because I was not pretty short. I was tall early on. So I think I only spent one season in the minor leagues as a shepherd before being called up to play a king. But lest I get too excited, I got to the kings only to discover that within the kings, there was also a pecking order. It was based on who got to carry the gifts. The senior king, which was usually a kid with the biggest mouth and arguably the meanest eyes, always got to carry the gold. The second in command got myrrh, and the new guy got frankincense because no one knew what frankincense was and the bottle was hard to carry and no one knew if there was actual frankincense in the bottle and if it spilled out, would it be like acid? Nobody knew anything. So for a long time, I carried the frankincense. I think it took me about five years to get from frankincense all the way up to gold. Anyway, you know the story, but do you really know the story? In the opening line of the hymn, We Three Kings, it says, We three kings of Orient are. In those six words, there are no fewer than three biblical and historical errors. First is the word three. Were there three kings? The Bible doesn't say so. It just says there were three gifts, hence Three kings, one gift per king. A logical argument, but not necessarily an accurate one. One of the kid, kings could have been carrying two gifts, or maybe there were three or four kings, and the third or fourth king uh, took turns carrying it, or maybe there was ten, and they played rock, paper, scissors for who would get to actually carry the gifts in. You know, in one extra canonical book of the Bible, which means a, a book that was written was not included in the Bible, it says that there were actually dozens of kings accompanied by thousands of soldiers. Who knows? Likely there were three, but not necessarily. The second mistake in that line from that song is the word king. Were they kings? Nope, they weren't. They were magi, astrologers. The word magi comes from the word magic, but they weren't magicians. They were learned men who followed patterns in the skies. They studied the magic of the stars. They were kind of like ancient astronomers. So how did they end up in the song or in the story becoming kings? Because there's a line in the Old Testament that says that the Messiah will be worshipped by kings. And so the early church gave the Magi an upgrade to fall in line with the prophecy. But almost without a doubt, they were not kings, they were astrologers, astronomers. And the third part that is questionable is it says, from the Orient are. We actually don't know where they came from. It just says in the Bible they came from the East. 
Remember the scale of the place that we're talking about. A very small land mass. So the east could have been the far east. It could have also been much closer than that. I remember when I was in PEI as a student minister, and I lived on the west part of the island, uh, near Summerside, and they would always talk about people from the east. And they didn't mean immigrants from China, they meant people from Charlottetown. So we have to be careful about knowing what east really meant. But why the Orient? Again, it's part of the rich tradition of the church. In the Armenian Gospel, which was written in the 6th century AD, so 600 years after the birth of Jesus, suggests that the kings represented each of the, the Hindus, the Arabs, and the Persians. They even gave them names, Balthazar, Melchior, and Casper. And it said that they actually bought more than three gifts. They bought fabrics, ancient writings, cinnamon, silver, and sapphires. Again, part of the rich tradition of the story, but not necessarily factual. So what do we know about these men? All we know is this. They were astrologers, summoned by the tyrant King Herod to find the baby Jesus. When they did, they were to go back and tell Herod so that he could honor the king, the baby. Herod, however, little did the astrologers know, defined honor the baby as actually killing the baby and thus removing a future threat. How did they get to where they went? You know the story. According to the Bible, they followed a star, a light in the sky to lead them to where he was. After leaving their gifts with him, they were warned in a dream not to return to Herod. So instead, they left at a different path home. That's what we know. But the power of the story of the wise men is not in its facts so much as in its metaphors, not in its facts so much as in its revealed truths. So I'm going to go in a very different direction this morning, and it's going to get a little complicated, so you might just want to notch your brain up to the next gear for a few moments. In our rich diversity in the Church of Theology, there's something called creation spirituality. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of it, but you're going to hear a lot of it because I'm going to do a series on this uh, in the winter, creation spirituality. It comes out of the progressive theology movement. And it's based on the idea that God is a force of creative energy that is in all things. A spirit, if you will, that we can harness that can bring to our lives peace, guidance, wisdom, and direction. It has four elements to it. The first is called via positiva, the second is via negativa, the third is via creativa, and the fourth is via transformativa. See, I told you I needed to get that brain chemistry going this morning, maybe even a dictionary. Basically, it means that the spiritual life has four stages, the positive, the negative, the creative, and the transformative. And the journey to spiritual awareness or awakenedness, we must travel through all four of those stages. It's fascinating stuff, and I actually can't wait to get into it in more depth in the coming weeks. But one very wise theologian has looked at the story of the wise men and concluded that it perfectly encapsulates the idea of creation spirituality. So bear with me. Don't turn off your TV or your computer and, and go back to making soup from your turkey leftovers. This is good stuff. So let's start with the first one, via positiva. The essence of this idea is that we all have a wondrous moment when we encounter the divine, when we recognize that the energy of the sacred is in all things. We may not have a name for it, but we know that there is an other out there, all around us, inside of us. Something that has created us and called us good, which loves us without question or limit. In other words, it is an awareness of the essential goodness of the universe itself. We can sense that creative energy in many places. Maybe you've sensed it, standing atop a mountain and, and gazing out, holding a baby for the first time and being overcome with a love you never knew existed. Or maybe when someone extends to you the hand of grace or forgiveness, 
and you feel the burdens drop and you feel a sense of peace. When we are aware that there is some form of other, some creative energy, some God, we want to find out more. We want to see where that sacredness can take us. Awareness of the sacred, even if you don't have a name for it, understanding the sacred as a force of goodness and love is the first step on a true spiritual journey. Being aware of God's presence and being aware that God's presence is essentially love can set us on a journey to discover where that energy, where that love can actually take us. And all of this in the story is captured by the star of Bethlehem. For the wise men, the star, the light, drew them into unknown places, towards unknown destinations. They didn't know where it would take them, but they wanted to follow it. They were willing to follow it, for they saw in the star a deep sense of the divine, pushing them further on the journey of life. A gentle nudge. A coincidental meeting when you weren't expecting it. A sudden path that opens up in your life unexpectedly and urge you to take that first tentative step towards it. This is the positive, creative energy of God, gently guiding us and always inviting us to follow, holding us in love and wanting for us only goodness, such as the Magi following the star. Then there's the second part, the via negativa. It is the mirror to the positive. In the story of the wise men, they had to deal with Herod. The tyrant king, he was known to have killed his own children out of jealousy that they may one day try to overthrow him. He was the manifestation of jealousy and pride and fear and power and ego. As we all know, such things exist in the world. Sometimes it exists in people. We may be following our stars in life with good intentions, loving intentions, only to come up against Herod. Some counterforce that wants to derail us or use us as Herod wished to use the wise men. Sometimes in the church or faith, we deny that such things or people exist. If we do that, it leaves us ill-prepared to deal with them when they enter our lives. Other times in the church, we're told to fear the Herods of the world, and so we never confront them. We avoid difficult situations at all costs. But creation spirituality invites us to see the negative never as something to be avoided or something to be feared but as a means of growth, as a means to the destination. To trust enough in our own inner goodness and worth, our own inner light, that we will confront that which stands in our way, knowing that no person and no force can throw us off course if we stay true to that inner light, that inner star that is always directing us towards goodness. Please note, the wise men entered into Herod's palace, but they didn't enter into his scheming. They stood in his presence, but they didn't let his presence stand in their way. Instead, they extracted from that negative place some good. Herod's aides offered the wise men uh, some direction as to where to go. There's a huge spiritual truth in this point. When we allow ourselves into negative or dark places, not to conquer or to be conquered, but to learn, we find there's wisdom there too. So, empowered by their own inner worth, they travel through the negative and back on to their journey. In creation spirituality, the negative in life is not something to be denied and it's not something to be avoided. It's not something to be scared of. It's part of the journey that we have to go through, led by the light of goodness and purpose. That will take us to the other side if we stay true to it. 
So now we get to the third stage. The wise men have seen the light. They've let it lead them forward. They've confronted the negative presence of Herod and not been defeated by it. And now they're back on track. The third stage of creation spirituality is via creativa, the creative spark part of the spiritual journey. Shedding the darkness of Herod's dishonesty and scheming, the wise men continue on their way, and they now notice that the light is a little brighter. It's brighter partly because they're getting closer to their destination. It's also brighter because they've come through darkness. Have you ever noticed that when you confront a difficult situation or a difficult person, and you come through to the other side, life seems brighter, and you seem stronger, and the path seems clearer. You have grown. Or to speak metaphorically, would we ever appreciate the dawn if it didn't come streaming out of the darkness? Could we ever notice a shooting star if the sky behind it wasn't pitch black? Light needs the darkness to reveal its essence. It needs the light, it needs the night to reveal its dawn. We are so quick in life to want to avoid anything or anyone that would make us uncomfortable or frightened, and so we back away. We avoid Herod. But when we do, we rarely get to the destination we need to get to. The spiritual journey is never about avoiding, but it's always about trusting. It is trusting that the warm glow of God's light within us will get us through those dark times. It's keeping our eyes on the star and not the blackness behind it. It's believing on the other side of darkness, the light will shine brighter and the path will be clearer and eventually it will take us to the place of life and birth and recreation embodied in the child of Bethlehem. And that brings me to the fourth and final stage of the journey, the stage of transformation or via transformativa. The wise men have followed the light. They've dared to confront the negative. From that, they've been strengthened on their journey. They've reached their destination. And what now? The story says they went home by another road. They stood in the presence of the Christ child, the incarnation of God, and it transformed them. They didn't want to go down the same old paths of the past. They didn't want to retrace their steps, for life had changed them. Something about standing in the presence of the child convinced them that life didn't have to be the same. It could be something more. It could be something new. Transformed, they left by a different road. There's nothing more powerful in life than a life that is transformed. Does it happen often? No. I think it sometimes happens rarely. But the promise of our faith is that it can happen. If it can happen, it can happen if we can acquaint ourselves with the deep goodness and love of God that not only guides us like a star, but its inner glow and power wants to wash away all that is keeping us from being the best we can be, all that's keeping us from transforming ourselves into our best selves. Maybe right now you're in need of something, some big change in your life, something new. Maybe you've been on the wrong road for a long time. Maybe you've been trapped in Herod's palace and you want to get out. You've lost the glow of the star that maybe at one time guided you, but now seems to have vanished into the darkness. The good news of the story of the wise men is that you can always get back on track because the star never leaves you. You're the one who leaves the star. The glow of God's eternal love and peace is always deep within you. Like a pilot light on a furnace, it doesn't go out. It just waits to be re-engaged. It is a force that wills only love and goodness for your life and wants you to live into the fullness of your created being. 
you can, this very day, start to make a change to reorient your life, to commit to finding the star again because it is up there. You can, this very day, decide that Herod has had a hold on your life for too long, and it's time to put that palace behind you, that palace of dishonesty or grief or regret that's held you a prisoner for too long. You were not made for the palace. You were made to follow the star. The palace wants to keep you, but the star wants to guide you. The palace wants to shield you from the incarnation of God's presence. The star wants to lead you right to its doorstep. And when it does, you will find the strength, the peace, to live a transformed life, to put the old path behind you, and to go ahead on a different route. And even if you're not looking for a big change in your life, but instead you're standing on the brink of a new year with perhaps the worst year of your life behind you, there's a message here too. I think we've all felt a little bit in 2020 like we've been quarantined in Herod's palace. And it's created some bitterness and some anger and some sadness and some fear. Then can I suggest it's time to leave that place. Time to put this year behind us. Time to pick up the trail of the star again. Because when we've been in darkness, the light on the other side is never more powerful and more compelling than we've ever noticed it before. My point today, friends, is that the power of the story of the wise men is not in its facts. It's in its truth. It offers the pattern for the spiritual life. It offers us hope for the new year. It's such a simple formula, but it truly can be a powerful and a transformative one. First of all, find the power of that positive light to guide you, for it is in everything, including you, the light and presence of God that wills for you only goodness and love. The light that shines in the darkness, as scripture says, that the darkness can never overcome. Secondly, don't avoid the challenges, don't avoid the darkness, and don't fear it. Go through it, boldly, courageously, for it too has its wisdom and its lessons. You can be in the presence of it without letting its presence be in you. And sometimes, the dark places, they're right inside of us. They too should not be avoided, but entered into listened to, honored, and eventually released from. When you bring light to dark, the light always wins. Thirdly, leave those dark places with renewed strength of how powerful the light really is. Let its positive energy push you forward, inspiring creative action and renewed strength. Let it take you into the presence of people and places where the light shines brightly. With Herod behind you, the star is going to be even brighter, and eventually <clears throat> it will take you to places in life where God's peace is incarnated, made real, given flesh, and you will see that the light was right all along. It does only will for your life love and goodness, and because you trusted it and followed it, you have been rewarded with something fresh and life-giving. And finally, let it transform you, or at least let it transform something within you. That's so inspired by that inner glow of love, you want to seek out new paths and new ideas and new places and new beginnings and new adventures. And like the wise men of old, you will leave the presence of the sacred by a new path, only to discover that the sacred is now going with you. Heavy stuff? Yeah, maybe a little. It's good stuff. And I'm really excited in the new year to explore some of this spirituality with you. Because after 2020, we all need a spiritual boost and a little wisdom. We all need a spiritual game plan that can take us into 2021 with energy and hope 
that we need to turn this ship around. So stay tuned, because there's more to come. But for today, we stand on the brink of 2021. And I want you to carry into the new year the image of that star, that quiet but persistent light of God's presence that shines for you and shines in you. It's inviting you on a journey, a journey of discovery, a journey of enlightenment, a journey that may take you at times through places that you don't want to go, but in the end, it will help you to arrive at exactly where you need to be. For the light that filled the sky that night so long ago is the same light that fills you, the light of God's peace, the light of God's presence that wills for you only love and wants for you only peace. Amen. Please join me now in our prayers to the people, and then we're going to uh, offer together the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Christmas has come, and Christmas has passed. A year like no other, a Christmas like no other. And yet we still give thanks for what this season revealed to us. The small blessings of gifts given and received, phone calls made, good food shared, and as always, the message of love revealed in song and worship. And now we get to look ahead to a new year, perhaps grateful that we can say goodbye to the old one. And we wonder what 2021 will have in store for us. We all want the same thing, God, for healing to come to this planet and for dawn to rise again after so much darkness. And so we pray for our leaders, our healthcare workers, and all those who continue to give so much to make things better. We pray that we will go into the new year much as the wise men approached the baby Jesus, aware of and alive to the inner glow of your presence within. A willingness to let challenges help us to grow in character and faith. An openness to see transformation in places that have darkened with fear or regret, or worry. This year, may we keep our eyes on the stars, but also our feet on the ground as we journey towards and forward into the unknown, ready for what it will reveal, securing the knowledge that through faith, you walk with us, our silent companion and friend. As we think of what is to come, we have our own prayers that are special only to us, we have our own hopes and our own dreams for what this year may bring. So now we're going to take a quiet moment to share those hopes, those dreams, those needs, and those prayers with you. God of the journey, lead us love us, and let us find blessings to come. May this year ahead be a new start, a new adventure, as we start to lift our weary heads from 2020 to welcome the dawn of something new. And hear us now as we continue to pray with the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for joining us today, and uh, I want to wish everybody out there a very happy new year. I'm going to end our service with our words of benediction, and then we will sing, Go Now in Peace. Go into the new year with joy guiding your footsteps. Go into the new year with hope in your heart. Go into the new year with the peace of God around you. Go into the new year excited to live and to love. 
Go in peace. Amen.